here to discuss how to tap into the LGBT community and their $830 billion each year is Chad Ferguson, president and founder of Auto Equality LLC. Please give him a warm welcome. Good morning, everyone. First, I want to start by saying what an exciting year this is. NADA 100, 100 years of the National Auto Dealers Association. So many changes and so many changes to come in the next years. I'm very proud to know that NADA is taking a progressive approach and outlook to the automotive industry and the times of today. I'm honored to be here to, to speak and to talk about a, a topic that is very progressive. Tapping into the LGBTQ community and their $830 billion each year. You know, when I first started thinking of, of what would I talk about at NADA? What would, what would make a difference? What would dealers want to hear? I started researching the spending habits of the LGBTQ community. And then I realized something. My title was wrong. And that how embarrassing is it going to be that I'm going to need to stand in front of my peers and NADA and admit that I made a mistake. So I had to make a change because I want to make sure that we're sharing the, the right information. So the $830 billion actually increased over the last year. $917 billion spent in retail by the LGBTQ community. That is a tremendous increase in a short period of time. So some of you may be wondering, since this is my, my first time to speak here at the NADA convention and to present workshops, who's, who's Chad Ferguson? Where did he come from? Well, I will tell you that when I started in the automotive industry over 21 years ago at a buy here, pay here lot selling note cars in Abilene, Texas, that I would have never, never guessed that I would be standing here in front of my peers, in front of you guys, being able to share my experiences and the knowledge that I've gained over the years. So it, it truly is an honor. But, you know, what... What really makes, what makes me an expert in, in this particular topic? Well, one, I'm, I've got 21 years of industry-specific knowledge. My entire career has been spent working in dealerships. So that has given me a unique insight on the automotive industry. I've worked in dealerships all over North America, working with a diverse group of people, a diverse group of dealers, both this country and other countries, such as Canada. And also, I'm a proud member of the LGBTQ community. So that has really given me a unique insight on the automotive industry and its relationship with the LGBTQ community. And I really see that we, we are, we've missed a few things. We, we certainly have recognized the importance of marketing to minority groups. We've worked on this for years. Now let's, let's take marketing to women, for example. Over the past 10 years, maybe even a little more, as an industry, we have realized that we have done a poor job at selling to, employing, and marketing to the females. In the, that are the female shopper and the female industry professionals. So there was a few companies that came about that really focused on improving that. Um, AskPatty.com, that was a, a company that uh, educated dealers on how to sell to women, how to communicate, and how to treat them appropriately when they come to the dealership. Marketing to um, other minority groups, like marketing to the Hispanic population. That's something that we've done throughout our, our careers. But really, what did we do to market to that minority group? Did we do a good job? Or did we just throw a sign out there that said, um, we speak Spanish? And we thought 
That'll do it. Now I'm going to tell you, funny thing, I've worked in a lot of dealerships that I see the We Speak Spanish logo. And there's not a person in that dealership that speaks Spanish. Doesn't change that we recognized the importance of marketing to that minority group. But we have forgotten one of the largest spending minority groups. I, had a, I was speaking with a, a, a Toyota rep the other day, giving some, some cool statistics from the Chicago market. And he was pointing out um, demographics and all of the, the sales that had, had happened to these, two, these groups. And nowhere on that, that list of, of minority groups and, and groups that they had sold cars to, did they list the LGBTQ community? And, and that, again, $917 billion in retail spent. So, I mean, I'm going to say it's, 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 it's a little challenge, I think, for most, because um, you really can't post a sign that says we speak LGBTQ, because what is that? What, how do you communicate effectively, market effectively to this group of people? So I think that if you're going to do any kind of marketing, you have to have a basic understanding. I was really amused when I first got selected to um, speak and give workshops here at NADA. Very first thing, like any normal person would do, I called my family. I'm like, oh my gosh. I talked to my stepdad and I said, I'm going to I'm going to give some workshops at the National Auto Dealers Association convention this year. And he said, oh my, that's great, Chad. On what? I said, well, I'm going to talk about marketing and selling to the LGBTQ community. And like a good parent would, he was, he was excited for me. And then asked this question, what is LGBTQ? I might have had the the hand of the forehead. Um, I wrote that one off to he's older, he lives in West Virginia, maybe, you know, let's go with the sheltered life. And so I explained uh, the acronym and he's like, oh, I get it, the gay community. I'm like, okay. So I thought, all right, this might be a little bit more work than I thought it's going to be. So spoke to a much younger industry professional uh, in Canada, very progressive country. And said, you know, I'm going to be speaking at NADA. I hope you guys come to, uh, to, to New Orleans from Canada to, to see some of the workshops. He said, oh, that's, that's great. What are you going to speak on? I said, well, marketing to the LGBTQ community. And he said, oh, my gosh, I think that is amazing. He paused and said, you know, but I have to ask a question. I know what the L is. I know what the G stands for. But what about all those other initials? I said, oh my gosh, well, I only said LGBTQ. What about LGBTQIA and, and all of the other acronyms that are out there? So I thought, okay, I, I, I'm going to have to take a couple of steps back and make sure that we're all on it, some of the same page and we understand some of these acronyms because I'm going to use them throughout this presentation. So. Let's, let's talk about the basic alphabet soup, all those letters. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, queer questioning, intersexual, asexual, or ally. Now, I could do an entire day's class on each one of those words and explaining and the social pressures and the, the struggles and, and what each one means, but I'm going to tell you, Google it. Want to have a little bit of fun? Google it, click images. You'll understand everything. So, don't do it at work, on a work computer. So, just the basics, but now the question comes, all right, I'm new to this acronym. Which, which one do I use? I've, I've heard GLBT, LGBT, LGBTQ, LGBTQIA. What should I use if I'm going to market and communicate? So the, the correct answer is, if you're going to use the LGBTQ 
LGBTQIA acronym, the proper one to use is LGBT, LGBTQ. That is, those are the most commonly used acronym. The acronym GLBT actually shows that you're a little behind times. That acronym was one of the first acronyms introduced to explain or to symbolize the group. That actually changed when the lesbian community was really being overlooked. So we made a shift and that became the first letter in that acronym. Also, you know, ladies first. Let's, let's use some of my southern values here. Um, so LGBT, LGBTQ is acceptable. And also, remember, gay is okay. It is absolutely okay. If you want to take a general term that encompasses the group, you can use the term gay in communication, conversation, or even marketing. So, anytime we're going to market to a group of people, we've got to understand a little bit about that demographic. Aside from the LGBTQ community, in this industry, we tend to get sold a lot of advertising. We tend to do a lot of what everyone else does. We don't always research. If you're gonna do any type of marketing in this industry, please, please, please do your research first before you decide on a marketing campaign. We are a very reactive industry. We are very knee-jerk. We see it, it's pretty, it's shiny, we do it. But we really don't even know what we're doing half the time. We do it because everyone else is. We do it because that rep came in and told us how great it was gonna work. Always, any marketing campaign to any group should be researched. So let's talk a little bit about this market understanding this market. So first, currently, six to seven percent of Americans age 18 and up identify themselves as LGBTQ, which translates to about 15 to 16 million people. Now let me explain a little something there. We have seen a change over the, the last few years which has made it seem like the LGBTQ population is growing. There's nothing in the water. We have now become a bit more accepting. Therefore, more people self-identify. So I think you're going to see over the next few years, it is a bit of a scary time. Anytime there's a, a change in government, administration, there's always policies and promises, and, and it makes makes everyone a little uneasy. We don't know what's going to happen next. Right now, we're experiencing that in the LGBTQ community. But I'm confident that as we move forward as a country and as a society, that we're going to still see that acceptance grow. We're going to still see that self-identification happening, which means the numbers increase. Eight, there's been an 80% increase in same-sex households. Again, the ability to self-identify, the comfort level that we have to self-identify has increased the number of same-sex households. 96% of same-sex couples live in urban areas compared to 94% of heterosexual couples. So currently and in previous to, to this year, you'll find larger concentrations of self-identifying LGBTQ communities in urban areas. But in 2014, Gallup polls noted a trend that LGBTQ individuals and couples were moving to far more conservative areas to find less expensive costs of living. I don't know where everyone in, in the room or the audience lives, but I am originally from Abilene, Texas. I've lived in Chicago for four and a half years now. Wow, what a difference. That rural area compared to that urban area in cost of living is. So I know that 
as we're being, as, as a community, as the acceptance is there, absolutely makes sense that the, you see that trend of moving towards more, um, more cost-effective living. 75% of people in same-sex couples are employed compared to 65% of opposite-sex couples. I don't know, 21 years in the car business, there's something I learned. I think it may have been in the first week of the auto industry. To buy a car, you need a job. So the employment um, percentages are higher in the LGBTQ community, which makes a more qualified customer. Also, compare the individuals. 72% of gay men, lesbians, and bisexual individuals are employed compared to 68% of heterosexual individuals. Again, we have jobs at a higher rate than um, uh, everyone else in, in the world. So this, this minority group, the strength is, is tremendous. Their buying power is huge. 47% of people in same-sex couples have a college education compared to 33% of opposite-sex couples. So we're smart and have jobs. Huh. Sounds like the kind of buyer that we need. Same-sex couples, and I'm going to tell you, I probably am the one who inches this statistic up just a little bit, and, and I get in trouble for it all the time. In fact, my, my partner's in the audience, and he'll agree that um, I, I, I'm the one who probably over the next year will, will help this statistic increase. Same-sex couples make 16% more shopping trips than opposite-sex couples. It's a problem for some of us. It, may, could, it could use an intervention. Average yearly spending is 25% higher for same-sex couples than opposite-sex couples. Again, I'm probably one of those that pushes that number up. But remember, gay doesn't mean wealthy. We're not rich, but there is something unique about our, our community. I don't know if any of you have ever heard this term before, but a dink. What is a dink? That's what makes a good portion of the LGBTQ community unique and gives us a little bit of money to spend. Dual income, no kids. Kids are expensive pets. When you don't have them, that means I have more money to spend. So again, when I started this journey of, of I need to help dealers learn how to get some of this money that's flying around out there, I had a, a, a dealer tell me, you know, I'm a higher end car dealership. We have our following. We have our loyal customer base. I'm not really sure how this impacts me. So I had to explain dual income, no kids, giving a larger expendable income, which means now high-end car dealer, this is the group that you want to tap into. All of us, we always want to sell a, a higher payment to a consumer. How many of us struggle with the consumers coming in and their budget is so tight? That they, they beat us up, they shop a tri-state area and still want a cheaper payment. I'm going to say it's probably those kids, it's those expensive pets that make that budget a bit tighter. So again, the, giving the buying power and the strength of our community uh, a little bit more, a little bit more meat to it. Now, I started doing a lot of this research and I thought, well, first I'm going to tell you that being in the car business, I've heard about what cars are gay cars and what cars aren't gay. And I really was, was kind of amused by this information because it's not what we might think. 
So let's talk about some data that was collect collected by Automotive News or Auto News over the la uh, from over 3 million American consumers who identified as LGBTQ. What were their favorite auto brands? So I'm going to tell you that the favorite auto brands really got impacted by the HRC's corporate index, the Human Rights Campaign, their corporate index. They're actually, they're, they're looking at companies and their, their hiring practices, their um, work environment, and rating them of which ones are the most LGBT friendly. And those manufacturers that score high on that list also score high on this list of vehicles sold. So we really have to think about our own environment in, in the dealership. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But let's go through this because it's pretty interesting information. Number five, Nissan. Number four, Honda. Number three, Chevrolet. Number two, Toyota. You want to take a guess at what number one is? Most commonly, I hear Subaru. Because I will say, Subaru years ago understood that the LGBTQ community would be a great base of customers and a loyal base of customers. So they began some marketing campaigns way ahead of times. But actually, it's not Subaru. It's Ford. So I don't know if I have any Ford dealers out there, but that just means, I guess, that Ford is the gayest vehicle. Oh, well, not really. Let's look at, by make and model, what did the LGBTQ community buy? And granted, we do, because remember, we're smart with money. We do have a large part of the population that buy those sensible sedans. But the truck ranks up there too. So let's look at number five. Sensible sedan, Honda Civic. Number four, sensible sedan, the Toyota Camry. Number three, the Chevy Silverado. Number two, the Honda Accord. Okay, no, I guess I can't get a drum roll, but Let's take a stab in the dark. What do we think number one is? Oh my gosh, it's even the gayest truck out there. The F-150. So the reality is, we buy what everybody else buys. We're really not as different of a consumer as most. We buy your vehicles. Now, I will say, I don't drive any of those. Doesn't mean we don't buy other makes and models as well. But these ranked in the top five. If you were to look at the top five or the top ten vehicles that just sell in general, you'll find that these all rank very high. So we're going to have to have a plan. What are we going to do? We see that the money's out there. We see we have an educated customer. We see that there's a huge population. Now, there is a statistic I'll share with you that wasn't, um, wasn't on any of the, the slides. And, and I, I really, I think this one hit home with me when I was talking to a, a small dealer in a small town. And it was, it, was, it was quite an interesting area. And he told me, you know, we really don't have any gays in our town. 96% of all communities, no matter the size, no matter the location, has a gay community. You just don't know about it because they know 
the environment that they're living in. So it becomes that I don't self-identify. I share that with you because I want you to know that everywhere, every dealership, every make, every model can benefit from an inclusive marketing campaign. So what are we going to do? First thing we do, set it already. Research, 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 research. Gather as much data as you can. Learn about sensitivities, preferences, motivations, etc. And we're going to talk about some of the sensitivities here in a minute. How many of you would agree tracking sources and results in the auto industry is a challenge? Well, I have bad news. Here's even more of a challenge. Tracking the results that you'll get from marketing to the LGBTQ community is going to be a little difficult. It will get easier as more people are comfortable self-identifying. How many of you do surveys, maybe in the business office, to try to find out which marketing campaign you ran in your dealership that brought the customer in and got them all the way to the finance office? How many of you include questions about the demographic? whether they're a minority group, and to any of them ask anything about the LGBTQ community? I know the answer. Toyota doesn't do it. They couldn't share that information with me. It's just now becoming a, a segment in the market that is getting more attention. So let's talk about po positioning and preparation and um, the things that we're going to have to do. One, to bring the customer, sell the customer. This is a little more than about just generating traffic because we generate a lot of traffic in this industry. It's really about the rubber meeting the road. So how will we make sure that the, that customer that we bring to the store actually buys a car from the store? So first thing I would do, positioning preparation, take a look through popular LGBTQ publications. Um, see how other companies, maybe even competition, represent themselves, if even at all. You'll see that there, you may have some competitors who are currently taking a stab at marketing to the LGBTQ community. And yes, we still have print publications in urban areas in the LGBTQ community. But those print publications are also online. Then whatever you see, you're going to have to do it better. All right, here's going to be the interesting one. This even goes back to the selling to women that we've been work trying to do well over the last 10, 15 years. Don't even attempt to market to the LGBTQ consumer until you've ensured equality in your hiring practices. Remember what we were talking about those, about those makes and models that sold and how that, those ranked highest because they also ranked highest on the HRC's Equality Index. We pay attention to those things. There are a lot of large dealer groups that are publicly traded, larger than some of the companies that are on the HRC's Equality Index. Not one automotive related company retail has made it anywhere on that list and that's a shame so we have to start thinking about our own hiring and our own environment within the auto industry you've got to make sure that you have a buy-in from the very top the highest management levels to the staff that's then going to interact with the customer. Salespeople, receptionist, service advisors. Wouldn't you guys, wouldn't we all agree it's customer experience is what sells cars. It's customer experience that creates a loyal customer base. It's customer experience that gets us referrals. If you don't talk about your marketing campaigns 
at all levels, then you're going to stump your toe on this one because the, the LGBTQ customer will come to your store and have um, a less than perfect experience. And we've heard it a million times. An unhappy customer will tell everyone they know. But here's a cool thing about the LGBTQ community. We also love to share our good experiences amongst our friends and family because it makes a difference. We notice the smallest things. Sensitivity training may be important and needed in your dealership. There are companies out there um, that can help with that. Um, you guys can, can get with me and I can sh give, share some information. There's a ton all over the country um, in all industries. So there, there's some resources I can get to you that'll, that'll help you find s some assistance in that area. But I have to, I gotta get on my soapbox for just a minute because 21 years in the auto industry, Starting in Abilene, Texas. If you've ever been to Abilene, Texas, well, I'm really not sure why you'd have been to Abilene, Texas, but it, we are in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the largest number of churches per capita. Just share that because we're a really conservative area. Um, that's where I started my career. As a gay man in the auto industry, I'm going to tell you I have seen, I have heard, I have turned a blind eye to some terrible environments. Not, and I really at first thought, it's, it's, it's Abilene, Texas. It's, we're in our own little kind of world here. But then I got the opportunity to be a consultant and a trainer and work in dealerships all over. And much like you don't see a lot of women working in the dealerships outside of receptionists and office and um, all of those types of clerical positions. In fact, a couple of years ago, the Women of Auto became an organization that started trying to promote and, and get women into leadership roles in the auto industry. Only 7% of general managers in the auto industry are female. We're in a very male-dominated industry and we think about our ownership because I'm gonna tell you, dealership environment starts at the top and goes down. Environment has been a little behind times. We, we know that because, gosh, women struggle in the, in the industry and and women can be women in the auto industry. They can, they can be themselves. So when I was here last year at NADA, I went to some of the women in automotive um, functions, and I started thinking to myself, what about the chads in the auto industry? There was a time that I truly felt being a gay male in the auto industry would never work because of the people I worked around. Last year, when I started talking about auto equality, applying for uh, the ability to speak and speak on an LGBTQ topic, I talked to a few people that are in the LGBTQ community and in the auto industry. One in particular, I said, you should, you, you should do this as well. Let's work together. And his response to me was, no, I'm not out. And I can't afford a loss of income. De I know some of my dealers would not work with me because I'm gay. So again, lit a fire under me. I thought, this is terrible. Absolutely terrible. I was very fortunate. I had a very dear friend that's um, a very successful woman in the auto industry who, when I was down and, and wanted out, she helped pick me up, dust me off, and throw me right back out there. Now, when I did throw my hand in the air and say, I'm applying to speak as openly gay and on an LGBTQ topic, our operations director of the, the company was a little worried. He said, you know, Chad, you've got to think about some of our clients. I'm 100% behind you, 
but this could negatively impact some of our business. We might have to make some adjustments. And I agree, there are some dealers that I um, have worked with, some dealerships, some environments that probably would be a challenge now. That's a shame. So we have to work as an industry to change that. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. I once was told, I thought, there was, a, there was a time in my life I thought I could be a Southern Baptist preacher. The car business got me. So, all right, let's get back to marketing here. We have got to determine whether we're going to take a passive approach or an aggressive approach to marketing to the LGBTQ community. Now, don't get me wrong. I definitely understand some of us have dealerships in urban areas, and I'm going to tell you, I've had, we talked about this, I think in a lot of urban areas, you do live in a, in a great bubble because you have not experienced some of the struggles that others experience. You've been a bit more ahead of times and accepting and progressive, and you've lived amongst large populations of the LGBTQ community. When we pop that bubble and we get outside into some other areas, it could be a little bit different. I understand that. And I definitely want you to think through your marketing campaign. If you're too aggressive, you may alienate some of your existing customers. So you're going to have to really think through and find that balance. So... What do, let's go back to what do, what do I mean by aggressive or, or passive? I mean, an aggressive approach, it could be that you are just out there and in, in, in extremely proud and having lots of, of, of displays of support and participating, flying flags. But that's a, that, that's a somewhat in-your-face approach, and it is great in a lot of areas. How many of you have driven by Harrah's here in New Orleans this week? There's the American flag. There's Louisiana flag. There's a Canadian flag. And a rainbow flag. I, I bet most of you didn't notice. But remember, it's the little things that this community is looking for. Your imagery can be different than that aggressive imagery. Just embrace the diverse families. These images will stand out to people in the LGBTQ community. A little goes a long way. I started frequenting a uh, breakfast place in, in our neighborhood. Started going there because they had a couple of little rainbow flags out front. It is an LGBTQ owned establishment and I continuously go there and there's better breakfast places close by but I go there because they're so, they, they first showed that support, that symbol that said hey we're with you and then we found out that we were actually supporting someone from our own community and we support people in our community There are a lot of stereotypes that you have to be very careful of that could take your LGBTQ customer and actually turn them off to your business. And most of us probably haven't thought of these things, but I want to run through a few stereotypes and things to avoid. Gay men are not all supermodels. Gay men are not all feminine. Sorry, Adam Lambert. It's the, it's the best picture I could find. Oh my gosh, lesbians aren't all hot. Or butch. Again, what a diverse community within a community. 
When you can feature LGBTQ employees or community members, you will have a much more effective marketing campaign. You have to remember, be confident and consistent with your marketing approach. I said it earlier, we are very knee-jerk and reactive people in this industry. If we don't see instant results, we bail out on a lot of things. We are the 90-day wonders. We try it for 90 days, and if it didn't work amazingly well, we're on to the next biggest, greatest plan, presentation. So we have to make sure that, especially marketing to minority groups, that you're confident and you're consistent, that that message is out there and out there for a while. Remember, it's gonna be a little hard to track, especially if you're not asking about the demographic, about the minority groups, to find out what's actually working. Where should we advertise? That's an age-old question, too. I'm gonna tell you, I've seen this for years. As an industry, I was trying to figure out where is the best place to spend the money? Where should I place my ad? Where should I position myself? I started in the car business before the internet. So it was definitely those traditional means of advertising, print, radio, television. But what about to the LGBTQ community? Where should I advertise? Well, we said it. If you're in an urban area, there's still pr print publications out there that are heavily and widely distributed to the community. Those publications can also be found online. So research both, but I'm going to tell you the, if you want to target a group and you want to go back to your store, you want to go today and start an advertising campaign and you want to target a specific group, a demographic, social media is the easiest and most affordable to put your toe in the water and, 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 and see how things go. But remember, Put the toe in the water, but you're going to have to leave it in there till it wrinkles up a little bit. We've got to be consistent. Let's talk about just, just one, one social media campaign that you could create. You can, go, you can use Facebook ads because they'll reach that exact audience that you want. So looking at this, this is... This is a couple of groups that, that have been pulled, and uh, you can kind of see how you can filter through consumers. So let's take that first group. Um, source, where do I want the people? I can pick the entire country, I can pick my hometown. I can, ex I can pick the entire country and exclude my hometown. I can pick behaviors. You think about finding people that that are qualified, that have money, that have expendable income. You could pick someone who travels frequently, um, whether it's for business or pleasure. You can, you can actually start filtering down um, to these, this group. You can pick that I want women. Um, I, I really don't know. I, I don't want anybody that's been to New Orleans. I want them in, a, in an age bracket, 25 to 47. And I want the females that are interested in women. I found, I found the lesbians online. With those filters, and I'm going to tell you, that's a, that's a pretty specific set of people. It's 290,000 people that you can find just on Facebook. I'm going to tell you, I do, I, my kids are teenagers now. And they tell me Facebook's a little behind times, that that's for us older people. I thought I was pretty advanced because I had my Facebook, but Twitter, other social medias can have target marketing done too. If you want business people, LinkedIn, there's, there's so many different social media platforms now that you can, that you can tackle. Um, I did this, a similar group, um, but did men interested in men, uh, some of the same some of the same uh, uh, filters and pull 240,000 people. So if you go back to your store today, you could do this, and these are very affordable ways to market to a group of people. 
Here's some good advertising. Let's look at a couple ads. How many of you love to travel? How many of you love the airports? Those of us that travel all the time, we really don't like airports anymore. But I was on a business trip, end of the week, walking through Philadelphia International Airport. Did you guys see what I saw? I saw that flag. It caught my eye. I usually don't pay attention to anything in the airport. I am laser focused on get me to the next gate, get me on a plane and hope there's no delays and get me out of here. I stopped and I watched that commercial again because I wanted to know what it was. So remember, a little goes a long way. Now they did make a slight mistake. They used a stereotype. They did take two very, very, very attractive men and put them in the ad. So, but I'm still going to say good job for making it subtle and having the inclusive advertising. Let's, say, let's look at another one. Everyone works hard for a reason. Working together, we can help you prepare financially for when two becomes three. Great job, Wells Fargo, of using the, uh, the modern family. Also, pull the HRC's uh, equality index. Look and see where Wells Fargo ranks. Right up there at the top. Now, I couldn't get... I, I looked really hard. I wanted to find some car ads that did a good job, and I did. I found one. Uh, Super Bowl ad. This is a chick car. This is a gay car. This is a short man's car. This is a cute car. Slow car. This is a single young professional car. This car has no street cred. This car ain't hip hop. Kidless. Cute. Small. This car doesn't care what you call it. Many did an okay job there. Uh, they used a very recognizable uh, lesbian figure and just, just a very short, uh, just a short clip, but it, it's something that's noticed. It's inclusive advertising. And that's what I'm looking for um, us to start doing as an auto industry so that on a dealership level, we can bring people to our store, bring people from the LGBTQ community to our store and get them to purchase a vehicle. The manufacturers have recognized the importance. Now, I'm going to tell you, even from a manufacturer level, when they have tremendous amounts of money and they can do tons of market research, they stump, they stump their toe occasionally. There is a, an ad that I'm going to show you next that, that Infinity got a little bit of backlash from. In fact, it's really hard to even find this commercial online anymore. Um, and, you know... Since I've been here at NADA, it's been very interesting the reaction I've gotten to people watching this ad. Some feel differently than others, but being in the LGBTQ community, I found it was not the most tasteful. Let's see if you guys remember this one. Look, 
this isn't easy for me either. I'm sorry if you don't like it, but it just feels right. This isn't how we raised you. You never wanted to try it? Enough. You must have known I was a little different. Not this different. So remember the sensitivities that we talked about. That ad to most in the LGBTQ community would be a little shocking because that coming out experience, that family conversation that a lot of us had to have was not always a positive experience and certainly not something to be taken lightly or to, to be used as, as, as a shock factor in a commercial. So be careful of the sensitivities and also um, those stereotypes. Here in just a second, we're going to take some questions, but I want you guys to know something. The LGBTQ family of today is not what most would expect. Not only will you be attracting the LGBTQ individual, but let's just take my family, for example. I do have two beautiful children, millennials, that will be your next shopper. They pay very close attention to advertising and to what's going on in the world today. Um, one of my best friends and biggest supporters in life now is my ex-wife, um, my partner, my parents, they're now very aware of what goes on in the world, and they're looking too. They're watching too. Gosh, I even have to always mention uh, my ex-husband-in-law. Think that one through for a minute. That would be my ex-wife's current husband. Ex-husband, yeah. Got it. A bank president who influences car purchases every day. Do you want to be inclusive and include the entire LGBTQ family? There is the family of today. So thank you everybody for being here. I think what an amazing step that you're here, you're watching, you're listening. It excites me about what we can see in the next few years. But if nothing else, go out today, love everyone, and sell some cars. Thank you guys for uh, being here. Don't forget to rate the session. Um, just go to the app and uh, click on the session and make sure you give it a rating. Again, thank you guys for, for being here with me today.